Alright, in this video I'm going to do, um, or talk about an article which was published in, two, in two, 2001 in the American Th Philosophical Quarterly by R Richard Feldman and Earl Connie. This is Internalism Defended. <clears throat> so, um, internalism in epistemology, that's typically kind of understood as the, the position that we can have or do have cognitive access to the justification of our beliefs. And the whole internal the whole internalism, externalism debate is kind of talking about the nature of justification and, and as to how all that all that stuff works. Um, so externalism <clears throat> is, is is the position held by people like Alvin Goldman who say that that we cannot or do or do not have uh, access or the or cognitive access to the justification of our of our beliefs. So Richard Feldman and Earl Connie come along in two thousand one, and they <clears throat> give a kind of a bit of a clarification of what this whole th of what the position is, and they kind of give a couple different accounts as to what as to what internalism is. Bollinger states that it is that a theory of, of justification is internalist if and only if it, it requires that uh, all the factors needed for a belief to be epistemically ju justified for, for a given person be cognitively accessible to, to that person internal to his cognitive pr perspective. <coughs> Plantinga states that the basic thrust of internalism in epistemology is that the properties that confer warrant Upon a belief, or properties to which the believer has some special special sort of of epistemic access. So they kind of give a couple different accounts, and <clears throat> the kind of buzz the whole buzzword is cognitive access. That if we can have cognitive access to epistemic ju justification, then your position is a, a is a internalist one. And that's a typically accepted uh, version of internalism. However, Connie and Feldman kind of break the whole thing apart, and they say that there's ac accessibilism, which is that whole cognitive access, and talking about internalism as having c cognitive access to uh, to um, justification. And that's that's what most of them are. And then there's mentalism. Um, access accessibilism holds that the epistemic ju justification of a person's belief is determined by things to which a person has some, sp some special sort of access. Um, internalism is a view that that, that, that person's beliefs are, are ju justified only by things that are internal to the person's mental life. That is mentalism. <clears throat> justification is conferred by a current mental factors. And... So that's kind of, they're going to go with this one, and they're going to kind of defend internalism by thinking about it this way, because there are certain problems that internalism has when looked at it by, in, in, terms of, in terms of this cognitive access that aren't really had here. So that's kind of, they, they kind of develop a defense of internalism via this way. And they talk, they talk about the the strong supervenience of justification on the mental, where they say that um, <clears throat> um, they kind of talk about it as um, that the contents of attitudes depend entirely on things within a person's own cognitive apparatus, within the view that there are factors external to the person. To, to determine attitudinal content. The, thirst, the, the thesis is, 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 is that a person's mental content supervenes on the person's purely internal states, events, and conditions. Therefore, the whole mentalism thing is that um, the, the, the external factors like, like that people like Goldman talk about, like causal processes or reli reliable processes or virtues like the external things, things that are not mental, don't really have mu much an effect on justification. And 
it's um, <clears throat> the at uh, the justification, and he he they kind of talked about this with a with a analog to fa to fa falsity of mind, and the whole whole point here though is that they are arguing that justification depends on what goes on inside cognitive beings. So, um, being epistemically, epistemically justified in certain attitudes or, or having attitudes with certain contents is settled by what goes on inside of it. Um, so, that's kind of where they're doing it. They, they're kind of arguing how internal differences affect justification. And they, and they give many, many examples and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss two of them. I'm going to discuss the first one, which is that Bob and Ray are sitting in an air-conditioned ho hotel lobby re reading yesterday's new newspaper. Each has read that it will be very warm today, and on that basis, each believes that it, that it is, it is very warm today. Then Bob goes outside and feels the heat. They both, they both continue to believe that it is very warm today. But, but at this point, Bob's belief is better justified. So <coughs> Ray is sitting there. And he's he's re he's reading the newspaper, and Bob goes outside and comes come, 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 come back in and says that hey, it's hot out. So Bob has had an experience of the heat outside. He has had a experience of it, which is a internal difference between Bob and Ray. And because Bob has had an experience, which um, is a internal factor affects his justification therefore Bob is better justified of the heat outside than Ray is because Ray has just read it and heard um, testimony or heard um, heard from another person um, that it is hot out so th therefore Bob is better justified because of internal differences um, now to the bird watchers a novice, bird, a novice bird, bird watcher and an expert are together looking for birds. They both get a, get a good look at a bird in a, in a nearby tree. Upon seeing the bird, an expert immediately knows that it is a woodpecker. The, the expert has fully reasonable beliefs about what woodpeckers look like. The, obvious, the novice has no good reason to believe that it is a woodpecker and is not justified in believing that it is. So, therefore, we have another case of um, <clears throat> internal differences affecting justification of our beliefs because the novice doesn't really have that good of a idea of what a woodpecker is like while the expert does so that we have internal differences which affect how justified a person is of a certain of a certain belief <clears throat> and um, they give many other things which I will I think it's better to read um, yourself. I don't feel like I need to go over the other things to state the main points. Um, um, there are epistemic differences in the, in, and it is reasonable to, to, ge to, ge to ge generalize from these examples that the, that the conclusion that every variety of change that, that brings about or enhances justification either internalizes Either internalizes on external fact, or makes a purely internal difference, or makes a, makes a purely internal difference. It appears that there is no need to appeal to anything external to explain any just justificatory difference. These considerations argue for the general internal stasis. These epistemic differences are have an entirely mental origin. In each case, it is, it is natural to regard the the mental difference as a difference in the evidence that, that the person has. So. <clears throat> People like Goldman, um, they want to try to appeal to um, things like ca causal, causal connections or reliable processes to account for one for one being justified of a certain belief. Well, through the many examples that Connie and Feldman give, they kind of show that either it's purely inter internal difference or a external factor is internalized. And therefore, the whole thing, everything that pertains to epistemic, to everything everything that pertains to epistemic justification, be, e, e, 
becomes internal if it is not internal already, and therefore everything that pertains to this is all in, is all internal. Therefore, we don't have to appeal to any experimental um, factors. <clears throat> now they have a uh, version of it, of internalism which is called evidentialism, which is the thesis that asserts that epistemic, ju epistemic ju justification is an entirely matter of evidence. They do argue this a little bit, but it's mostly they are mostly what they are doing is they are giving a defense of internalism and showing how we don't need we, we, we don't have to appeal to um, external factors when we when when we're talking about this. So then after that they have they they talk about a few different objections to their uh, stance and then they also talk about a couple different other things too. So I'm gonna kind of go over these briefly. So first we have impulsional evidence, which is kind of an uh, issue which is posed to internalism by Alvin Plantinga, and um, kind of impulsional evidence is um, uh, um, uh, that I have an impulse to believe something, and something seems attractive. Therefore, I should I should believe in it, and he's kind of arguing that um, beliefs have impulsional um, characteristics. Um, <clears throat> so, therefore, um, the, oh, it's called he calls it a felt attractiveness, which seems to believe that. Um, so we have like the the, the, the proposition two, two two plus one equals three. Um, that's like we have a felt attractiveness to believe that. While it's possible that even though we have that felt attractiveness, um, that's kind of evidential s support. Um, this so believing something. Be or choosing, choosing to choosing to believe something because of felt attractiveness of it is kind of um, impulsional evidence, and um, that kind of can pose a problem for internalism because um, as to how something becomes impulsional cannot entirely be internally um, figured out as to how that is the case. Therefore, that's kind of a can pose, can pose problem, but Connie and Feldman state, state that um, not, th not, everything that, not everything that we, do, do we believe feels attractive in this way or another. Therefore, not everything that we believe is of this kind of evidence. Um, and therefore, we don't really have to um, we don't really have to appeal to external things as to how as to make the whole thing work. Stored beliefs, which is something by Goldman. If you want to know more about this, I think you should probably read the whole thing because that's probably it's kind of hard for me to explain it because I don't want to go into it too far. Um, stored beliefs. It's like he's Goldman is kind of saying that internal states count can account for the justification of stored beliefs. The problem is this. At any given moment, almost nothing of what, of what we know is consciously considered. Um, stored beliefs are not a current beliefs. And si since, since we know them, we are, ju we are justified in believing them. But what internalist basis can, we, can, believe, can, can these beliefs be justified? So... Goldman says that no, that no, no perceptual experience, no conscious memory event, no premises consciously entertained at these at these select moment will be justificationally sufficient for such a belief. Um, so, on the one hand, he assumes that it's sufficient for such a belief. Um, so, on the one hand, he assumes that virtually all justified beliefs are stored beliefs. On the, on the other hand, he assumes that the 
internalists must find something conscious to serve as their, as their justification. So, what can be had is that either a, a, a way to kind of show this is that, or I guess the whole, the whole problem here is that, um, how can a, if we have stored beliefs which are not currently considered, how can they be justified with purely internal factors since, since, since stored beliefs are not consciously considered at any given moment? Um, there are two ways to kind of go about it. You could think about it as you have the disposition to justify them at any moment. Therefore, you have stuff near you. You have um, things near you which could be had uh, which could be had in order to justify any given stored belief that you have, or you could have stored justifications for your for your your stored beliefs. And those those are the two possible things that they give here. Kanye and Feldman. Third one is about forgotten evidence, and that's like you. He, the, uh, the, the, the business actually. I think. Uh, Forgotten evidence. Um, that's like um, you um, read something about broccoli being healthful, and you keep on having that belief, but you forget where you where the evidence for your belief that broccoli is healthful. You forget the evidence for it, and yet and yet you still have that belief. So how can you? So therefore, you don't you don't have any really more internal justification for your um, belief because you because you forgot the evidence for it. Um, that, so it could be that you that you got it from a reputable source, or you could or you could 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 have, could have gotten it from a dis or from a disreputable source. This is also from Goldman from Goldman, by the way. Um, um, so, even though we've forgotten evidence for a certain belief, can a internalist explain how we are justified in certain in, in believing something, even though we forget the original evidence? Um, and then as we have the issue here, is all evidence conscious evidence? Um, and we could have... Here again, the whole thing is that we have a disposition to justify. Therefore, we have stuff near us which we could, at any moment, use to justify it. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, that's kind of a issue. Um, even even if you could get that back from the fact that this, he, there, he's he's talking about Sally, um, Sally belief falls short of knowledge. It does not follow that that it has not been carried a good distance toward knowledge. Thus, the initial weakness in this in this objection is that its concluding inference is invalid. Um, <clears throat> we can still have a just a, a, a justified true belief that is not knowledge. In this case, we can have a we can have a, a Gettier case here, where it's justified in its true belief, though because of how it has been forgotten, we still we have a good distance toward knowledge, but we don't have knowledge because of this. And again, we still could solve this with the whole idea that we have the disposition or the possibility of justifying any belief at any at any given time. And then he they they call this this next part links and connections. Um, William Alston talks about the higher order requirement for internalism, for higher 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 order belief, which is the idea that that that, that if the argument that leads to the conclusion that only in, in, internal factors can serve as uh, justifies a sound, there is there is also a sound argument to the conclusion for for a belief to be justified, the believer must be able to tell which factors justify the belief. Therefore, a higher order belief. Therefore, like you, if you have a belief, and you have a justification for that belief, you have to ha you have to you have to be able to tell. That's the that's a big issue posed towards in towards internalism. 
you have, you have to be able to tell. Um, tell why your belief is justified. Um, so that's kind of like we have the issue of what these guys call deontological under, underpinning this. Issues of epistemic duty or epistemic evaluations um, where any given belief do we have to figure out if we are violating any kind of any kind of epistemic duty or can we do we have to go do we have to epistemically evaluate any belief at any given moment and create and can find the reason the reason why we why we believe something because if we had this if we still had if we if we, if we were still doing internalism via accessibilism we we, we, we might still need those deontological under, underpinnings but, but but because of this because of a um, a current mental state justifying our beliefs, we don't need these. And then we have the issue of justification of introspective beliefs. Um, thus, um, <clears throat> like how we we have we are we we are able to intros to introspectively think about a triangle. Um, but can we at the same time think about a 23-sided figure? Um, um, why does having a suitable experience of a, of a triangle, triangle justify the, the introspective belief that one is having that experience? While our experience of a 23-sided figure does not justify for us for the belief that we are having that experience. So, how can we justify that we are having the experience um, with a three-sided figure? That's fine because we have re recognition of it. Um, <clears throat> only by learning some such asso asso association could a person have to have justification for having experience for making these sorts of classifications of images. Um, Internalists can, can, can plausibly appeal to this sort of background information as the internal difference that accounts for differences in justifications in these cases. So th this is from Sosa, by the way. Um, so that's a lot of different issues that we that they do discuss, and I think if you were taking a epistemology class, should be more closely look, looked over. But the main the main conclusion here is that uh, there's no there's no genuine problem for um, internalism, and I would have to I would have to agree. Um, I think that I would have to definitely agree that um, any that um, that justification for any belief is by a current a current mental mental factors, and that any belief saying like a religious belief can only be can only be can only be justified for for yourself because of your uh, current mental factors. So. Um, if you think I've messed something up or left, some, or left something out, tell me below in the comments or if you have a question. Um, I don't think I explained the objections and stuff too well, so if you would like a better explanation of that or you think I kind of did it wrong or left, left, something, left some key info out, let me know. Um, also, because whenever you comment, I get an email. If your comment is constructive, then I'll always respond. Thank you.